I've got kind of a strange question for you. How would you hide a correct reading comp answer? Imagine you are creating questions for ETS, you're hired by them, and you know what the right answer is, and you want to hide it by surrounding it with incorrect answers. How would you hide that correct RC answer? I thought a lot about this, and I went through several examples, and I'm gonna show you them today from official ETS sources. I thought about the ways they hide the correct answers. I thought of three main ways that you can hide a correct answer. First, you can distract students with answers that are probably true, but they're either off topic or they're too extreme. And I'm gonna give you lots of examples in a moment. So that's one good way of doing it. You distract people from the correct answer by giving them plausible answers that are probably true, they're just not discussing what the question was asking. Or they're on the right lines, but they're a bit too extreme, they go too far. That's one very common way, one or two very common ways. Second, you could do it, and not many people think about this, but you could get students to debate false comparisons. So you could pick an on-topic answer, not off-topic this time, an on-topic answer, except it's debating something or comparing something that's not being discussed in the question. And there's one final way I want to point out you could hide a correct reading comp answer. You disguise the right answer behind difficult vocabulary. And you can kind of hope that maybe if a student doesn't recognize a keyword, they'll be scared of that answer and not pick it. Let me give you a simple example before we come across the harder examples, the real official examples. Okay, we have a very brief passage here. Author. Buses are cool, okay? If people use buses instead of cars, they would have less of a carbon footprint. Very simple argument and conclusion. Which of the following would the author most likely agree with? Okay, look at how we can disguise the correct answer. The correct answer will come at the end. Buses are cheaper than cars. A lot of you are nodding and going, yeah, I think the author would agree with that, right? The author seems to love buses, what's the problem? The problem is that this answer is off topic. We were discussing carbon footprint and this answer is discussing cost, it being cheaper. Yes, it's probably true that buses are cheaper than cars and it's probably true that the author agrees with that because most people agree with that, it's common sense. But we weren't discussing the cheapness or the cost of cars or buses, so this is off topic. Let's try and trick you with another incorrect answer. Buses are the only carbon-friendly mode of transport. You might think this is very tempting because we talked about buses having a lower carbon footprint. What's wrong with this? What's wrong is the extreme language. Buses are the only carbon-friendly mode of transport. Or there are no alternatives to buses. Words like no, only, must, necessary. These kind of extreme words are good ways of slipping in an incorrect answer. What's another example? Buses have less of a carbon footprint than trains. This is probably a much more tempting incorrect answer for you guys. And it does something key that I've noticed a lot of answers do. It brings up a false comparison. While this may or may not be true, and given the passage, we might think the author agrees with this because the author seems to love buses. It's a debate that we weren't getting into. We weren't debating whether buses have less carbon footprint than trains. We were comparing buses to cars. So this answer is irrelevant because it's a false comparison. It gets us distracted with a debate that's not the heart of the debate we were trying to have. And finally, what about the correct answer? The amount of carbon used is an important way to differentiate modes of transport. This is correct because clearly the author seems to emphasize how carbon and the amount of carbon footprint a mode of transport has is an important factor. But the way that they have disguised this, or I have disguised this as a correct answer, is I threw in that word differentiate. And some students, if they didn't know a particular word or didn't know the word differentiate, they would go, I I don't know what that means, I'm just gonna pick a different answer. I'm gonna pick an answer whose words I know. Well, here, the problem is I've put you off a correct answer by bringing in tough vocab. 
And now we're going to move on to official examples. But I just want you to think about if you were a test maker, if you were writing questions, you have to find ways to disguise the right answer, don't you? You can't have obviously wrong answers. Like all people riding buses are psychopaths. Like every student is going to spot that that's a wrong answer. So think about how you would disguise the answer. And remember, they're disguising it in the same ways. Picking plausible answers that are just off topic. Maybe picking great answers, that just the language is a bit too extreme. Or making a comparison, focusing on a debate that we're not having, a false comparison. Or maybe throwing in a few hard words. Okay, now that I've got you to think about that kind of thing, we're going to move on to some official examples. So this question here. Obviously, it's a shorter passage, but I wanted to get across the same techniques that we're going to use. This is going to be harder now because they're experts in disguising correct answers, but let's go for it. As it happens, and you may have seen my other videos on reading comp, I'm also going to be using the techniques that I recommend for answering these passage questions in terms of reading slowly, engaging with the text, and stopping and summarizing. Let's go. Reviving the practice of using elements of popular music in classical composition, an approach that had been in hibernation, sleep, in the United States during the 1960s, composer Philip Glass embraced the ethos of popular music in his compositions. Okay, so this guy wanted to bring back the practice of using popular music in classical composition. I love it when musicians do that. Glass based two symphonies on music by rock musicians David Bowie and Brian Eno. But the symphony's sound is distinctively his. So he's still being original, but he's fusing these styles. Popular elements do not appear out of place in Glass's classical music. So he pulls it off, which from its early days had shared, has shared certain harmonies and rhythms with rock music. Yet this use of popular elements has not made Glass a composer of popular music. So you wouldn't call him a pop composer. His music is not a version of popular music packaged to attract classical listeners. It is high art for listeners steeped in rock rather than the classics. So he's still a classical musician. He just caters to people who like rock too. A lovely little passage. Select only one answer choice. The passage addresses which of the following issues related to Glass's use of popular elements in his classical compositions. In other words, the passage is really talking about which of these issues in terms of him using pop in classical compositions. Instead of going at our normal speed to so just pick an answer and then move on, I'm going to carefully analyse each of the wrong answers and talk about how they created these wrong answers. Let's start with the first one, which arguably is the most tempting incorrect answer. Does the passage address how his music, his use of popular elements, is regarded by listeners who prefer rock to the classics? Can you spot the mistake here? The mistake, in my opinion, is, and it's a very tempting answer because the last line says, it is high art, his music, for listeners steeped in rock rather than the classics. The problem is, it's a false comparison. A talks about it's designed for listeners who prefer rock to the classics. But we never debated whether people prefer rock compared to classics, or the audience is made up of people who love rock much more than the classics. It never made that comparison. It said it's for people who are used to rock. Steeped in means used to disguising that with hard words. But yeah, it's great for people who are used to rock rather than the classics. But we never said it's for people who prefer rock to the classics. So I would say it's a tempting answer that we might not immediately eliminate. But the problem is the false comparison. We were never debating whether people preferred rock compared to classics. What about B? How it has affected the commercial success of Glass's music. This is a bit like the buses being cheaper than cars example I gave earlier. We never talked about commercial success. It was never discussed how commercially, monetarily successful his music might be. It's probably true, though. Like, a lot of you are going to be nodding and being like, well, this guy seems great, right? The author is praising this person, so maybe he did make a lot of money. Maybe, probably, 
but we don't know. It was never discussed. So that's how they threw in this incorrect answer. They designed it to be plausible because this guy's popular, so he's probably commercially successful, but we never directly mentioned that, so it's false. C, whether it has contributed to a revival of interest, yeah, we talked about reviving the practice in the first line, among other composers in using popular elements. The glaring thing there, you probably noticed, other composers. We never once talk about the effect on other composers. It's probably true, if this guy did it well, other people might copy him, but we never talk about it. So that's how they designed this incorrect answer. Again, implying that it was successful and spread to other composers, but we never technically talked about that. D, it's quite similar. Whether it has had a detrimental, a bad effect on Glass's reputation as a composer of classical music. Now, detrimental is a hard word, so it's quite tempting here. But the problem is we never talked about his reputation. It never said he has since become marginalized by this work or his reputation has suffered. We never discussed his reputation there. So this is off topic. It was never directly mentioned. Leaving us with the correct answer. Why is this answer the correct answer? Well, throughout the passage, it does address whether his works are original or derivative. Now, of course, you do need to know the tough vocab, right? You need to know that derivative means unoriginal. So does the passage discuss him being original versus unoriginal? Yes, many times. It discusses it by saying that his work was based on something else, but that it was distinctively his, it was original. Yes, it did share harmonies, but it wasn't a version. We repeatedly discuss whether his works are original or derivative. But notice, it does depend on you knowing the word derivative. So if you didn't know the word derivative, you would be a bit lost here. So all those techniques that we talked about earlier, they have used to try and fool you. They have thrown in a false comparison, talking about whether people prefer rock over the classics. We never debated that. It threw in three different things that were never directly mentioned, that were off topic. Commercial success, other composers, and his personal reputation. And finally, just to throw you off in one last way, they disguised the correct answer with a bit of hard vocab. I'm not saying derivative was the only hard word there. There was the word detrimental. So it's not like you can just look for the hard words and that's always the right answer. But it was one way they could try to throw you off. Okay, let's do another example based on the same passage. And I've got one other example from a different passage to finish off with after. Okay, question two. The passage suggests that Glass's work displays which of the following qualities? His work. Is it a return to the use of popular music in classical compositions? Yes, in the first line, it said reviving the practice of using elements. It does depend on you knowing the word reviving though. You do need to know that reviving means bringing back to life. Just quickly, the etymology, vita is life. So reviving is bringing back to life, like vitality or lots of words with vita as life. But anyway. So reviving means bringing back to life. And so, yes, we do have proof that it was a return to the use of popular music. It used to be the case earlier that this was true. So, yes, a correct answer disguised slightly with a hard word there. You need to know that reviving means like a return. And this was directly mentioned. What about B? An attempt to elevate rock music to an artistic status more closely approximating that of classical music. You might have spotted this. It's a false comparison. We're not debating the artistic status of rock compared to classical, saying that maybe now rock is just as good as classical or better than classical. We're not having that debate. This is not about elevating rock music and saying it's just as good or better than classical. It's a false debate. Don't be tempted by that. So B is wrong. C. Does Glass's work display the following quality of a long-standing tendency to incorporate elements from two apparently disparate music styles? Yes, as long as you understand a couple of the words here, you don't need to understand all of them maybe, but incorporate means to bring together or share. Disparate means they seem different, these music styles. And of course, throughout, we have evidence that he was trying to bring together different styles the rock and classical. 
talked about how he shared certain harmonies and rhythms with rock music. He brought them together. And it said as well that popular elements do not appear out of place. He was bringing together these elements. And again, the only thing that might put you off C is perhaps not knowing the word disparate or incorporate, but it's clearly a correct answer directly mentioned in the passage. Okay, I've got one last brilliant example, and I hope you guys are liking this style of analyzing incorrect answers in more depth and getting you to think about how you would disguise a correct answer. Because when you start thinking like that, you can start sympathizing with these people and being like, oh yeah, well, you can't have obviously incorrect answers. You have to make the answers sound probable or plausible. And what's the best way to do that? Just pick things that are slightly off topic, or maybe the language goes a bit too far. It's a great way to think about these questions, like how you would design them. Anyway, one final passage. What you may want to do now is pause the video, read the passage in the top right. Again, it's a short one, just so I could fit it on the screen, and then answer the question on the left. But we're gonna be looking out for those same things. This is a slightly harder one, so we're gonna do it together perhaps. Okay, what's the question? Electric washing machines, first introduced in the United States in 1925, significantly reduced the amount of time spent washing a given amount of clothes. Brilliant. Yet the average amount of time households spent washing clothes increased after 1925. Hang on a second, what? So we're saying that washing machines sped things up, obviously, but the amount of time that households did this, washed clothes, went up. How is that even possible? At this point, you might want to guess, by the way, how that could happen. That's what I would do, but I don't want to give away the answer, so I'm going to move on. This increase is partially accounted for by the fact that many urban households had previously sent their clothes to professional laundries. So that's what they used to do, send it off to laundries. But the average amount of time spent washing clothes also increased for rural households with no access to professional laundries. So the author is saying, okay, we can explain it for urban households. They just stopped sending it to laundries and therefore did it themselves, so the time went up. But why did the time also go up for rural households who didn't have those laundries? And again, you might want to think and predict how that could be true. But either way, can we agree on a couple of things? Can we agree that we have a paradox? That there's this time-saving washing machine, and yet there was more time spent washing. Okay, it's a paradox. And to put it even more simply, the key variable that we're talking about, the key thing we're trying to resolve, is we're talking about the time people spent washing. That might sound obvious, but it's really important to think about what is on topic in the answers that we're looking for and what's off topic. What is on topic, what we're trying to discuss, is we're trying to resolve this paradox. Let me quickly read the question, actually. I should have done that. Which of the following, if true, most helps to explain why the time spent washing clothes increased in rural areas. Yeah, I definitely should have read that first, but either way, based on the question and the passage, hopefully you clearly agree with me that the key variable is the time spent washing. Obviously, I'm spending more time than in a real test, but I just want you to understand again how they create wrong answers. So let's start with the first incorrect answer here. I'm not doing it in any particular order, so we're going to start with B. B, households that had sent their clothes to professional laundries before 1925 were more likely than other households to purchase an electric washing machine when they became available. So they're saying that the people who used to go to laundries are more likely to buy these washing machines, which kind of makes sense. There's two problems with that. First, we're not resolving the paradox. Why is it that the rural people are spending more time washing the clothes? And second of all, the variable that B talks about, as I've highlighted, is how many people purchase something. That's not what we're talking about. It's not the key variable. That's an off-topic discussion. It's not key how many purchase the machine. What we were discussing was the time spent washing. So again, this is a plausible answer. It's really interesting to note who's buying these washing machines. So it's probable, it's plausible, it's to tempt you and distract you, but that isn't the debate we're having. Next one, C. People living in urban households that had previously sent their clothes to professional laundries typically owned more clothes than did people living in rural households. Really interesting about who had more clothes, but is that really the debate we're having? Is the debate we're having about who has more clothes to wash? 
No. The debate we're having is about how much time we spend washing. So it's not the key variable. So watch out for that. Next one. Let's do D. The earliest electric washing machines required the user to spend much more time beside the machine than do modern electric washing machines. You guys are thinking, brilliant, finally, we've got an answer that talks about the time we spend washing. What's the problem? It's a false comparison. We're comparing the amount of time we spent washing back in the 1920s compared to modern electric washing machines. That's not the debate we're having. We're being sidetracked, distracted. They're tempting you like a cat with a ball. They're hoping you get distracted by this debate about, oh, those earlier electric washing machines, they took far more time than the modern ones. Yeah, well, that's great. That's true. We were discussing, though, the question was about rural households and how much time they spent washing back in the 1920s. So don't distract me with this kind of stuff. Don't distract me with a false comparison, a debate that we weren't actually originally talking about. It is the correct key variable this time. We are talking about the time spent washing, but it's a false comparison. Okay, next one, E. In the 1920s and 30s, the proportion of rural households with electricity was smaller than the proportion of urban households with electricity. Now, some of you are thinking, okay, so they had less electricity, so maybe they had to use the washing machines more. But the problem is you're making assumption after assumption. Okay, this E is talking about electricity, but somehow maybe if they had less electricity, then maybe they could use the washing machines less. But how does that explain the fact that they used it more? It's all based on assumption after assumption. We're not talking about that key variable, time spent washing. Instead, E kicks off with something different, which is the amount of people or the proportion of people with electricity. Very plausible, very probable. Yes, this is very interesting about how many people had electricity because it does affect washing machines. It's just not directly on topic, which obviously leaves us with A. So why is A the correct answer? People with access to an electric washing machine typically wore their clothes many fewer times before washing them than did people without access to electric washing machines. Now, what makes this a harder question? It's harder because the key variable, the amount of time spent washing, is hidden in this answer. You have to use common sense to realize that A massively affects the amount of time that you spend washing. With A, if people wore their clothes many fewer times, as in they wash them far more often, well, that kind of explains it. Even though the washing machine massively speeds up the washes, if you're washing far more often, maybe being more hygienic, then of course, overall, you might spend more time washing your clothes. This resolves the paradox. What makes it harder is they never said explicitly the word time. You have to realize that, of course, if you wash your clothes more often, that means you're gonna spend more time washing those clothes. So it was the key variable, slightly more hidden than before, not explicit, but implicit. A talked about the right thing without any off-topic distraction. What made it disguised here wasn't hard vocabulary, it was the fact that you had to use your common sense to realize that if people wash their clothes more often, then of course that means they spend more time washing their clothes. Which brings me back to an observation I made while we were reading the passage, which was you could have predicted that answer and got things right very quickly while you were reading the passage. How can it be true that a washing machine speeds up the time to wash clothes and yet you spend more time washing clothes? Well, the obvious answer is that you just wash more often. And so if we'd have predicted that answer, we maybe would have picked out A much more quickly. But the message today was much more about looking at commonalities in incorrect answers, getting into the heads of the examiners and thinking about how they create a wrong answer. And the best ways they do it, as I said in my original slide, is by picking off-topic examples or using extreme language, doing false comparisons, bringing up a debate that we're not having in time or location, for example, and finally, by occasionally using fancy vocabulary to throw you off the scent. I really hope this helps you to think about reading comp questions. 
And if you want to practice many more, I've got a verbal playlist for you to check out. Have a great day.